Welcome everybody to this session. I think we have people just uh, joining, coming in. So whether it's in your morning, your afternoon or evening, a huge warm welcome to this session on working across sectors for children's protection and well-being. We're very pleased to have you and we have a great um, session set up for you, quite an interactive session set up for you with a whole host of um, informed speakers from, I think we're six, five or six different sectors. And then of course, we're gonna be turning to you for your thoughts and ideas about the topic as well. Before going any further, let me introduce myself as we get the right screens, the right images up on your screen. My name is Joanna Wedge. Uh, I work for UNICEF Seconde to the Alliance as a co-lead of the CPMS working group. So of the working group that looks at overseas, um, the implementation and promotion of the minimum standards for child protection in humanitarian action. Uh, and as many of you know, who've looked at that document, we have a complete pillar devoted to child protection working with other sectors. And so we'll talk about that in just a moment, but that is my role. And with that, I'm happy to be here facilitating um, this session. So this session really is for all humanitarian actors who acknowledge that sometimes the majority or close to the majority of the people that we work with in a conflict, in a disaster setting are children. And we are looking for better ways to improve their protection and well-being outcomes. So we're so pleased that you're here to learn with us and learn alongside us as we learn from some of the panelists and, and you as well. So as we get started, I wanted to introduce my illustrious panel here. Um, and maybe everyone's screen is on, but if you could raise your hand. With us, we have David Skinner, who is the education cluster coordinator across UK, Ukraine. He is in Kyiv at the moment, and he is with Save the Children. We have Agnes Tiliak, who is a protection officer working within the Global Camp Coordination and Camp Management Support Team at IOM's headquarters, and she is in Istanbul. Literally alongside her in Istanbul is Kate Holland. Kate is the CCCM coordinator in Iraq, and she is with UNHCR. We have Yang Fu, who is a child protection and emergency specialist with Plan International, and she is currently in New York. And we have Nurian Zunong, who is a health specialist we save the children in a global capacity, and she is joining us right now from Boston. So welcome to you all, and thank you so much for being part of our Alliance Annual Meeting today. All right, if we move to the next slide, we have a little bit of housekeeping in that we wanted to, uh, the slide doesn't show very well though, <laughs> we wanted to ask you to add something to your names. We're going to be moving into different breakout rooms and they'll be focused on a sector of your interest. So they'll have a theme of child protection throughout, but we're also looking for um, you to name yourselves and thus be moved into a room that's going to discuss a second sector. So if it is food security, and I think I'll need the producer's help here. If it is food security, it is an asterisk. You put that at the end of your name. And if you go down, producers again, help me if you go to, you no, know, could someone step in and explain how you re rename yourselves for participants? Yes, sure. How you rename yourself, everyone. If you just hover over your video feed, there are three little dots and you click on those dots and you have the option to rename yourself. And then at the end of your name, if you're interested in food security, we ask that you add a star or an asterisk. If you're interested in health, then it would be to add the percentage sign. If it's in, if you're interested in education, then we would ask you, oops. So we're joining together around a common dilemma, which is that we have put forward as a humanitarian sector, the centrality of protection of the people that we are serving, the affected populations. And yet we know that we have yet to clearly operationalize how we do that. So if we come to the next point, which is that half of the population, approximately half of the population in our uh, affected groups are indeed children. And so we really need to be grappling with the centrality, not only of protection writ large, but also of children's protection. And this is something that in the clarion call, which was launched in October, the clarion call for 
Child Protection and Humanitarian Action and the Alliance overall. We have the centrality of children's protection and well-being reached as central, um, as at the forefront of what we're doing as a cohesive group, as a collective, as an alliance, and across all of the sector. We can go to the next point and the next one. So we acknowledge that children's needs are holistic and that their rights are indivisible. And we need to be working as child protection actors and as humanitarians with the whole host of sectors and actors and allies who are available to work with children and their families to improve their protection outcomes. So we set ourselves the questions of how do we as humanitarian workers effectively collaborate to improve both children's protection and well-being. So this is what led us to um, the, what we call the Working Across Sectors Initiative. And this is an initiative by the CPMS, the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group, which was one of the four working groups of the Alliance. And we have an initiative which runs from 2022 this year until 2025 to be trying to grapple with this question about effective collaboration to improve outcomes, protection outcomes for children. We go on to our next slide. So after consultations in 2021 with about 385 stakeholders, we decided to focus on actual and potential collaboration with four um, uh, prioritized sectors. So education, camp coordination and camp management, health and food security. And so our working group is focused on increasing our ties, our collaboration, our understanding, our ways of working with, um, uh, with these clusters. And thus you have our panel today. So as I said, 385 stakeholders were consulted to come up with a framework, an intersectoral, extor, excuse me, an intersectoral framework that we've launched in the last week or so called Working Together. Um, they came from those stakeholders, many of whom sit on the panel today, come from different sectors and different technical backgrounds. They came from different regions and different levels of where we're working, including local and national actors. Um, we have some government uh, gave feedback, INGOs, UN agencies. So really we tried to make it as broad as possible in terms of what, how, what are some of the challenges? What are some of the obstacles? What are some of the wins we've already had? And what are some of the opportunities we have, particularly in these four prioritized sectors? And so we came out with our intersectoral framework, which we've just released, as I said, our version one. And we plan on updating, tweaking, renewing it every six months or so. So what we're sharing with you is the, the main image from um, our version one which we launched um, uh, last month going through the next six months. So the development of the framework really helped us engage and focus on listening um, to different actors in all sorts of humanitarian settings, refugee settings, urban refugee settings, mixed settings, natural disasters, and so on. And it, the purpose of it was to develop a common understanding of children's protection across sectors, including our general perceptions and mis misperceptions, misunderstandings. It helps us identify key barriers to effective collaboration with our prioritized sectors. It identifies key opportunities for increasing prioritization of children's protection and well-being. And it identifies recommendations and priority actions which will build effectively on our ways to work together. So you can see the different components here, including our overall vision of humanitarian action where children's protection and well-being are institutionalized as core commitments by all actors and across all our sectors. So if we go to the next slide, I wanted to talk particularly about some of our drivers. As you know from um, uh, the whole theme of the Alliance's annual meeting, one of the key topics that we're talking about and one of our key objectives in the Clarion Call is not only about working across sectors, but increasing our accountability to children and to their families. So one of the um, core aspects of the framework is talking about and addressing risks that children face, protection risks that are specific to children, and also our accountability to children. And we feel that minimum standards, humanitarian standards, but in particular, obviously, the child protection minimum standards are a key tool 
in being accountable to, uh, to children and their families, telling them what they can expect from us as humanitarian workers, specialized in child protection, but also those workers who um, are coming to them or are interfacing with them because of their work in food security or nutrition or camp management or WASH and so on, all of the standards that are listed under our pillar four. So we see opportunities to integrate children's protection into the standards, the guidance, the tools that other sectors have. Um, and we've been very privileged to have a chance to, for example, um, be part of the CCCM minimum standards uh, drafting and, and generation and now implementation as it rolls out across the country. Um, INEE, the education minimum standards are uh, going through a revision process of which we are part. And we've been also um, part as a sector of um, insights and, and revision with some of the other um, sets of standards that um, are being developed or, or reviewed in the past, sorry, revised in the past year or currently. So for us, it's a great honor um, and, and something that we really um, respect having the opportunity to, to input into that top level guidance. We want to be building on coordination and collaboration and with our ongoing project of working across sectors, um, we have many opportunities that are opening up for us to be collaborating. For example, in our work, there are some tools that, um, that one of my colleagues is working on collecting um, and then uh, revising in a collaborative a co revision process with other sectors. Uh, we are co developing uh, a series of videos um, with our education colleagues as one of them, with food security colleagues as another, and also coordinating and, and collaborating on the um, creation of some e learning together. So this is a wonderful opportunity that we throw out to actors who are listening, as well as um, to, to those who hear this at a later date, to be working with us on co-generating new tools, educational tools, instructional tools, awareness materials, and so on, because we really want to be coordinating um, and, and, uh, and working together. Um, so reaching up, we need to be reaching up to the humanitarian, the, the higher levels of the humanitarian structures, the higher levels of humanitarian leadership. So together creating a voice, um, an advocacy uh, strategy through the Alliance and through other platforms such as within CCCM, which, such as within education, um, with INEE and so on to influence um, those who are in the more powerful positions in the donor community, in humanitarian leadership, to really help us collaborate effectively, to identify what is effective, and also then to be able to do it, to pilot it, to test it, to reinforce it, to help us structure ourselves along those lines. And then finally, two other um, uh, pieces. And here, I think we can have a couple of the clicks will, will bring us to um, uh, some of the some of the things I wanted to stress. So strengthening the workforce competencies. So we in Child Protection have a great document that was created by our learning and development colleagues about our competencies. So we are eager to be working with other sectors to look at how can we build from them in terms of our competency framework and how can we influence or tweak here and there what competencies they, their workforce might need in order to be working um, uh, to better um, child protection outcomes and ways of working with children generally. And then finally, something we're going to focus on primarily for the rest of, the, of this um, hour and a half um, is about building data, building evidence, and learning from that. We at the working group undertook a series of evidence reviews, uh, which are in the process of being released over the coming month or so. We did so on our four prioritized sectors. So um, as you will hear, Yang led something on food security. Um, uh, some colleagues from INEE joined us in doing a review of evidence of child protection and education working together. And then we were able to do some shorter reviews for the health sector and child protection and for camp coordination and camp management and child protection. Because really we know that we have gaps in our evidence of how can 
uh, CCCM and child protection better work together? How can we understand each other uh, more cohesively and so on? How do we um, ensure that our resources are maximized when we work together, et cetera? And so we really want to be unpacking that and building a stronger evidence base over the three years of our initiative. And so we're gonna look uh, now uh, in our time together about um, where we feel we are at and where we, we hope to be to be going. Okay, if we come to the next, our next point. So we want to start by sending you off to breakout rooms, which is why you um, added a little asterisk or exclamation point or anything at the the rest of the um, at the rest of the uh, sorry at the rest of the at the rest of your name. There's been a request to put an asterisk next to your name if you want to stay in this room and have interpretation. However, I know that an asterisk has been used for education, food security for food security. So um, for the uh, producers, that's that's a double up. So we can't use a, an asterisk if people want to stay in the room. If people don't have something next to the room, my understanding was that they would stay here. Um, if you have a preference, then please add it to your name um, with those little symbols that we've talked about before. So you're going to be sent to a breakout room to dis discuss child protection and the sector that you've chosen. So if you want to have interpretation or if you want to discuss a sector that's not one of our prioritized sectors, that's perfectly fine. We're asking you to stay here and we'll be a multi-sectoral, multilingual room. In that room that you're going to, you're going to discuss two things. So what are some key things that child protection actors don't know or don't understand about CCCM or about uh, food security, et cetera? And then in the second, Part of the question or the second question is what are ways in which that sector can be blind or less aware of children's protection risks and children's ability so there is a jam board for each of your rooms and so we're going to ask you to um, to go to your specific jam board and uh, assign and, and, and put up your different thoughts which we will capture you have 15 minutes um, I believe it's just under 15 minutes that we'll have left, but we'll give you a halfway point and a reminder right at the end, where we hope that you're going to have a very honest, open discussion and a lively discussion about what are some of the weaknesses and strengths of working together. So we hope you can be blunt, honest, um, and um, and, uh, and that we can, we can see you uh, back in the plenary where a rapporteur has already been assigned and uh, we'll come back and hear a little bit from each room. All right, if we could launch the breakout rooms. Thank you, Jana. I'd just like to add on to that to just say that there, all the rooms are open and there's not many people who have given us any, uh, you know, uh, exclamation marks or asterisks just to let you know that the room has been opened for each participant to select which room they want to go to as Joanna said that if you want to remain in the main room if you need interpretation that's fine but I have put a few people in the room for those who haven't put anything next to their names please just note that you can hover over where you see breakout rooms and you can just select the room that you would like to go into thank you very much and we'll see you all shortly so we still have a fairly large group here so I'm hoping that we'll see I'm happy to have lots of people with me but I'm hoping that others will see that it's a chance to specifically talk about education or specifically talk about CCCM or food security or health. Okay, I'm going to assume Stephanie has not been moved to a room. Is that, not sure if it's required, if there's a lot of people who want to go to one room, I guess we can't really tell. At the moment. Maybe for those of you. Sorry, Joanna, please continue. Maybe for those of you who are remaining with me, can you let me know in the chat box, is there a particular sector that you would like to talk about? Are you here because it's, language interpretation, which is fine. Are you here because you'd like to talk about WASH or about nutrition, which aren't one of our prioritized areas, so we don't have a room for those. So if you can put in the chat box and let me know, we can maybe steer the conversations a little bit towards those specific sectors, or else Stephanie, you're very uh, welcome to remain with us in the main group. Okay, let us then um, launch into our questions. 
Um, and since we're here in a, a larger group, um, a more multi-sectoral group, um, then our questions will have to be that little bit broader. Um, so the first question was, what are key things that child protection actors don't know or don't understand about other sectors? Since we're not going to talk, if you want to talk about a specific one, say, well, in WASH, you know, child protection actors often don't realize that the equipment that we buy is, is not something that we have much control over at camp level. It's further up the chain. Or that the posters that we generate about hygiene, uh, we don't have visual artists who know how to do drawings that connect with children or whatever may be. Um, it would be good to have your ideas. If I were to ask you, and I will start naming names if, uh, if need be, what are some of the obstacles um, or what are some of the ways that child protection act, we as child protection actors are maybe misunderstood or other sectors don't necessarily have uh, clarity about? I'm just here mainly generally to talk about um, some of the things that for us in child protection, we, we don't know about other sectors and I was hoping to, to kind of, of, of get a, a general view from people, but what I know about something that's been coming up uh, quite recently is um, how do we kind of involve children in humanitarian action across the sector? I know we, we talk a lot about integrating and, and mainstreaming child protection messaging and all of that, but there has been a lot of conversation around how to actually involve children in humanitarian response, which sometimes can be a little bit um, um, risky in terms of the, the, the way the population is moving as some of the issues that, that we, we address in this uh, space is a very rapidly moving crisis, especially when you're dealing with humanitarian crisis and how you involve children in that can be a bit um, tricky. So we do know that from experience and all of the different crises we've, we've, we've um, responded to, there are some good examples, but I was just wondering how do we actually do that since these things are coming up more as we see uh, humanitarian crisis taking different kind of, 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 you know, they're moving in different ways. Wonderful, thanks Space for being the first one to briefly turn on your mic. Um, and you're putting down, laying down the gauntlet for us, or giving us a challenge, um, which is that we, as, as our own sector as child protection, but also working with other humanitarian actors across the board, how do we involve children? How do we know when it is safe? How do we know when that safety has moved, is, has passed? It is no longer um, a, a safe time and place for them to be involved in particular humanitarian action? Mm -hmm. How do, do, are there times where we underestimate their ability to engage and, and be drivers of their own um, activities and operations and so on? Um, mm -hmm. So I think you're raising that it's a, a challenge for child protection and yeah. ed education as other actors who work directly with children as, as their mandate, yeah. um, but also then for colleagues across the humanitarian world. Don't know if anyone wants to take up that question or want to throw something else into the ring. So Jacqueline is hoping to be sent to education. The producer could help her. Don't know if there's others who are following through translation and we need to allow a little bit of time for that or not. But I can see we have colleagues from AFSI and UNICEF, from World Vision. And I'm wondering, for your organizations, which are multi-sectoral, mm -hmm. what are ways that you see internally, you know, sometimes realizing, oh, there's a misunderstanding here. We don't have a common language. We don't come, have a common understanding of children's capacities or what a protection risk is, or, you know, how we need to prioritize nutrition at this particular moment in the response or, or so on. Yeah, I mean, I can cite like a few examples that we, we when we when we did the COVID response. So because I think that was like a health emergency and the population was more like stable, we were able to involve children in a lot of the activities we did, especially on education in, in emergency and the radio program in Sierra Leone and in 
in other countries. So they were part of the, the um, I wouldn't necessarily say we, we had them involved in the initial stage of the planning, but during implementation. So we kind of like had them in mind. And most time, we all know, we don't, we, we I mean, we don't, we do our analysis and we understand the issues that children, you know, have. And based on that, we develop programs. But I've never seen where we actually, you know, involve children together in developing projects and, and programs and all of that. But we do do the, the pre-assessment and all of that with children in mind. We ask the right questions. We involve them to an extent. And then while we are implementing, they are part of that whole process and evaluation. So for, I would say for COVID, it was a little bit easy because that was like a stationary population. People are not moving from place to place. And it was also a humanitarian crisis as we'll call it, but health related. But then when you come to the situation of the um, conflict or some other crisis that you, requires people to move from place to place. And, and then we, we always hear, how do we, we need to involve children in the planning and implementation of humanitarian programs. And I, and I hear other sectors say like, you can't be serious because this is a rapidly moving emergency. So we can't have, you know, so I was just thinking it depends on, for me, from my experience, the type of emergency and the level of involvement and meaningful participation we have with children. But in some emergency, it's not, you can't do that because you put them at risk. And, and sometimes maybe you end up defeating the purpose for which you wanted to, you know, to to have, to obtain or to 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 actually reach meaningful participation of children. Super. Yeah, it seems that the, the timing was a little bit off in the breakout room. So apologies, perhaps we can um, draw from each other. Hopefully there was some good conversation starting um, and we can draw them out a little bit more in the plenary. Um, is there, we were just, we had a, a larger group and a larger perspective here than diving into any one particular sector. Um, is there an example that we um, can get back from a couple of the rooms who wanted to volunteer? We can volunteer from CCC. Ah. Um, that was really interesting. Um, I think the, just about to get into a good discussion of that, I think generally there was a nice agreement among the child protection and CCCM actors in the room about CCCM being part of protection. Um, and we had the start of what might be quite an interesting discussion in terms of the confusion that comes out from the CCCM side and the child protection side around what is CCCM, what is shelter? So getting into the physical aspect of the site, who is responsible for that? Do people need to turn to camp management? Um, and then from the technical aspect of the site planning side, which admittedly confusingly, depending on your context and depending upon the organization, sometimes sits in CCCM and sometimes sits in shelter. Um, what are the technical aspects of the, the site planners? So the people who really look at the physical aspects of the site that maybe they don't know protection concerns, they don't know child protection concerns, and then how to get that um, technical expertise to them from the very outset and then kind of throughout the life of the camp. Anyone else from the CCCMCP room want to throw something in? No, I think that, I mean, maybe any participant uh, can, of course, just now we had no time to, to uh, reach the second question. Uh, so uh, that's a pity, but it was a very interesting uh, start of a discussion. So we hope we can find a, a relevant forum to, to keep it on. Okay, we have everyone's names and contacts, so maybe we can. <laughs> Um, does someone, uh, Nurian, did you want to speak or Yang or David, anyone want to throw in what you were talking about in your group? Uh, for the health sector group, we had very a uh, small group and we had the very lively discussion. The main takeaway for me, at least from the group discussion is that uh, people perceive a health and nutrition sector to be very like highly technical sector. So at least from child protection uh, actors point of view, there, there is very limited opportunity to integrate in, at least that's how they perceive it. But we, because we didn't have a time to discuss the second question. So I was unable to explain what, why, what, what I think is important to integrate or where as a gaps where 
not get entry points for us to integrate uh, child protection into health or uh, like the colleagues who were in the health discussion se sector, please add. Do you want to give us a, an entry point or two, Naryan? What would you say if I put you on the spot and said, give us two entry points based on what came up at least? Yes. Uh, I think for health, we like we have a, it's a, we have a, it's a sector where we have in interaction with the children even before they were born. Right, we provide antenatal care for mothers when the ch child is still in the mother's womb, and that's the, like can be an entry point to educate the parents. And we also have a, like uh, facility-based services, the primary care, the secondary care. And we also have a lot of community-based health interventions where I think could be good uh, platform for us to integrate child protection into health service delivery. I wish I had more time to discuss with, uh, with other colleagues because at least we were getting into very good discussion. <laughs> Excellent. Well, as I say, we can regroup you. Um, and we will have a Q&A towards the end, so we'll be able to ask specific questions then. Um, do any of the other groups want to give a little bit of feedback? Yeah, Joanna, so from food security, um, we, uh, we were mostly child protection colleagues, and I think something that came up was it's hard to know what you don't know. And so what, you know, similar, I think, to what um, CCCM and health said, kind of understanding what are the interventions? What are the modalities that the other sectors are using? And then how it's important for us as child protection actors to be a little bit familiar with these so that we know what are the best entry points. We know how to support the most vulnerable children who may also be facing food insecurity. People are still filling into the jam board and I see a great question around providing cash assistance to unaccompanied and separated children or unaccompanied minors. And in the food security sector, you know, I think half of all food assistance is now in the form of cash and voucher assistance. So also understanding where are entry points there. So the beginning, I think of some good, some good discussions. And uh, shall I come in on education? So um, you asked us to be brutal. Um, I don't know that we were brutal, but I think, mm. we, I think we were, I think we were surprisingly honest very quickly, which I think was great. Um, so essentially the child protection colleagues were worried that um, educationists or teachers weren't taking child protection seriously enough. They didn't see it as being core to what they were doing. Um, and, the, um, and the educationists were concerned that child protection colleagues didn't realise that teachers had other responsibilities apart from child protection, um, for example, teaching. Um, and so... And there was a very, I think, astute comment that this actually reflects the fact that many systems are simply not functioning, that are simply not properly resourced. Because, of course, in a functioning system, um, teachers w w absolutely want to take child protection seriously. And, of course, in a functioning system, um, people would understand that teachers have got wider responsibilities. And so I think what we're actually looking at is systems which need more resources so that children can be properly protected and properly and, and can learn effectively and I think that was key. The other point that came up which um, kind of um, envelops that is the importance as well of thinking about teachers mental health and not just the mental health of students um, which I think was something which uh, um, can, can, can very often be overlooked in the in, in the areas we're working. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'm glad you got in there, whether it was brutal, whether it was honest, open, however, however you frame the conversation. And then just quickly in, uh, in the main group, um, one of the participants faced she threw out the challenge around children's involvement in humanitarian action and in our operations. And that's something that we grapple with in child protection. When is it protective to uh, involve children and to what level of stage and in a rapidly changing context? And when is it not? So what, let's be honest about what we don't know, even as those who focus, whose mandate is specifically on children. And then when other sectors, we're asking other sectors to involve children more, to have children participate more in their work. You know, what kind of guidance, what kind of two-way avenue is there to discuss? Well, this is how it could be shaped now at the moment with this group of children and, and, um, and, uh, and allow for that to evolve. 
um, as I say, in a rapidly changing context. So thank you for that quick um, chance to work in groups and we'll see how we can continue that outside of this forum. There will be some question time later on. So if you have a specific question for one of our panelists, please um, let us know. I was uh, in the chat box, you can write any of your questions. Um, looks like there's a lively discussion going on in the chat box, which is super. I was remiss and didn't ask much about you, our audience. So if we could launch our first poll, um, that would be great to the producers. We wanted to know from you which sectors you were coming from that you primarily worked in. Here you go. So we have um, we have food security missing. My apologies to Yang and our food security colleagues. It was to be there, education, health, camp coordination and camp management and food security. And then other sector, including um, uh, food security, wash if you're here, nutrition uh, and so on. Don't have many participants yet answering. It should be on our screen. But on the background, if we could get our next slide up, if we could broadcast our next slide, we're going to move into a presentation about food security in particular. Um, yes, if it's another sector, put camp management, uh, sorry, put uh, other. All right, well, I can see from who has responded so far um, that we have about 20% uh, education, about 10% health, uh, it says nobody for camp coordination, camp management. So I know that's not true, um, but a small percentage for, oh, it's disappeared, okay? Uh, and then other sectors um, is the majority. So child protection and some other sectors. All right, we wanted to talk about evidence now and uh, our evidence reviews in particular, um, uh, what we are learning about um, coming up with a common understanding, a common platform, common language, um, and a common understanding of the gaps and the things that we need to be focusing on. Um, I'm very pleased as we kick it off to pass the floor to my colleague Yang Fu, who, as I said, is at Plan International, and she's been working um, with the Global Food Security Cluster, as well as uh, the CPAOR, on a review of evidence between child protections work and food security. So let me pass the floor over to you, Yang. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks so much for this opportunity to learn from everybody here about working across sectors, what's working and the challenges. Um, we're really excited about this initiative, which is led by the Global Child Protection Area of Responsibility and Plan International. And what we're trying to achieve through collaboration and promoting collaboration between child protection and food security clusters at country level. And as you've said, Joanna, we've also had the support of the Global Food Security Cluster, which has been really invaluable. So our aim is to bring together child protection and food security actors to work to identifying how both sectors can strengthen integrated programming, how we can provide technical support through practical tools, and then also document good practices, look at what's working um, through case studies. And we thought, um, I'm still on the first slide, um, we thought that um, the first step for this initiative should really be to review the evidence to look at how are how is food security and children's protection and well-being actually linked i think we have a lot of anecdotal evidence we've heard and we've also heard and witnessed a lot through our own work but what do we actually have in terms of proof and evidence so in a way it was about building the basics what do we already know and i think as i go through um, my presentation i would love to hear from those um, in the audience, um, if there's anything that really resonates with you in terms of your your child protection experience or your food security experience, um, and if you think there's anything that um, that we may have missed, so we looked at academic and gray literature across humanitarian contexts. We also spoke to child protection and food security actors, and so from this, I want to briefly highlight five things today. So next slide, please. So the first finding um, on the next slide, great, is that children's experiences of food security are unique. They're different from adults and they're different from other children. And this may seem super, super obvious, but it's often not recognized and it can be really important. So children's age, their gender, their developmental stage, their agency, 
their status within their families and communities. This, ex um, this affects the extent to which food security and insecurity directly impacts their safety and well-being. Girls and boys, we see them play key roles. Um, yes, and disability. Uh, we see them um, play key roles within their uh, family's food production, their family's um, access, and utilization of food. And so in times of food instability, they are directly affected. Adolescent girls, they may be responsible for food preparation for the entire household. They report skipping meals um, to allow younger siblings to eat. They may be called upon to take care of family members so that their parents and caregivers can go and seek work or um, seek food, forcing them to miss out on school. Food preparation often entails collecting firewood, spending hours fetching water, um, which puts them or can put them at risk of sexual harassment and sexual violence. Adolescent boys also play or may also play a really important role in their family's food production, farming and animal cultivation. We saw some evidence that younger children may be given greater protection and care by caregivers, by older siblings from food insecurity. So in one study, children reported um, lower food insecurity than adults um, living in the same household, indicating that they were better protected. However, in that same study, it found that children who were categorized as orphans were the only group of children for which this wasn't true. In other words, they weren't being protected from food insecurity at the household level. So children, even within the same household, may be having very different experiences. The second key finding, and this one I have to say really stood out to me, was the link between food insecurity and mental health and psychosocial well-being, not only of children, but really importantly also of caregivers. And this is on the next slide. So in a global review of food insecurity and mental health data, found that food insecurity was associated with poorer mental health um, indices for women and men in every region of the world. So as food insecurity worsened, so did um, conditions such as sadness, worry, stress, and anger. In low and middle income countries, food insecurity has been associated with three times greater odds of high symptoms of depression and anxiety. And we know in child protection that this directly impacts the ability of caregivers to provide and care for their children. We saw that in multiple contexts, children describe food security, described having enough to eat, described having a diverse diet as one of the definitions to them of having what they called a good life. But in contexts, and humanitarian crises where food was scarce, children reported stress, anxiety, sadness, and shame. Um, there's also documentation how of food linking food and security with worsened uh, ten increased tensions at household level, as well as affecting the relationships between caregivers and children. And in a few settings, it's also been associated with. Um, an increase in children's experiences of violence and abuse at the household level. So in Burkina Faso, one study with uh, mothers found that during times of food shortage, when young people were displaying increased signs of distress, mothers also reported increased anxiety, increased anger, and also anger directed um, at their children. So we see this strong relationship between food insecurity mental health and psychosocial well-being. And I think this is really so, um, so relevant given that we know the COVID-19 pandemic has also not only worsened food security, but also mental health outcomes in many contexts. The third finding is around negative coping mechanisms. And I think this is something that many of us are probably familiar with. Um, so on the next slide, we see how food insecurity can lead to things such as uh, child protection risks, such as child marriage. 
and food insecurity and having one less mouth to feed being one of the drivers in addition to gender inequality, harmful cultural norms, the lack of other available services and opportunities. In one context with recurring disasters, families reported marrying off their daughters in um, expectation of shocks. So some families reported marrying off their daughters in anticipation of losing their homes and their livelihoods to natural disasters. My colleagues from PLAN and the Women's Refugee Commission presented earlier today a study um, in food insecure areas of Zimbabwe, and they also found that food insecurity was one of the factors that impacted um, adolescent girls' experience of marriage. I'm not sure if it's possible to move to slide three. Um, another strong um, negative coping mechanism um, that came out of the review was also around sexual exploitation, particularly for adolescent girls. So sex in exchange for access to food or money to buy food. And in several contexts, children and adolescents reported hunger as making adolescent girls more vulnerable to sexual exploitation. There's also a strong link with child marriage, um, danger and injuries, sexual violence, and even uh, recruitment by armed forces and armed groups. In the evidence review, we also saw linkages between food insecurity and intimate partner violence, which directly impacts children living within those households. There's also a documented link between food insecurity and peer violence and bullying. So, so much really to unpack under this key finding um, and a lot more to learn as well. And this doesn't even include the potential risks of food security programming itself and the potential risks such as sexual exploitation and abuse, family separation, neglect, et cetera. The fourth, um, the fourth thing that I'd like to highlight on the next slide, and apologies um, that the formatting has gone a bit off, um, is this kind of long-term perpetuating cycle, harmful cycle between food insecurity and child protection. And in some cases, this link is really clear. So we can look at the example of child marriage. We know that one in five girls around the world are married before the age of 18 and married adolescent girls can find themselves in a very difficult situation. In several contexts, girls reported being abused by their in-laws, by other wives, even being denied for food as a form of abuse. Um, married girls may face challenges in advocating um, for access to food for themselves and possibly even for their children. And they lack also knowledge about health, nutrition, and food security. We know that girls who are married young experience higher rates of anemia, of malnutrition than those who are married later in life. And children who are born to adolescent mothers are also more likely to experience poor nutritional status and this kind of lack of access to nutrition can also have significant impacts on brain development, which then undermines readiness for school, educational attainment, future economic outcomes, et cetera. So really this long-term impact that children's experiences and child protection risks, which are a result of food insecurity can also potentially increase their chances of future food insecurity. And the last takeaway, and I'm so glad that somebody mentioned this earlier in the breakout rooms, is that despite the findings above, food crises and responses you know, frequently overlook children's experiences and voices. So we find that children are rarely consulted or asked about how the food crisis is impacting them, and yet they remain one of the more vulnerable groups. And the evidence review found very few studies from humanitarian context, which looks specifically at the impact of food insecurity on children. And I think the issue that one of our colleagues raised about, um, um, I, only heard, I only heard part of it, apologies, um, but perhaps around the capacity to consult children, the potential risks around that is something also that was raised by um, food security actors that we talked about, that we talked to. So also understanding our own capacity as child protection actors to support food security actors and better um, consulting with children and how to do this safely. So I think in a way, you know, this um, 
this key finding also relates to the extent to which child protection and food security actors reported collaborating. We did find some exciting examples of promising practice. And I think a recognition from actors that we spoke to that this was an important linkage, but working across sectors um, remains something that's still pretty nascent between child protection and food security. Those are the key findings. Um, I think I just wanna conclude by, you know, say asking, you know, what does this mean for us if we can really gather evidence on how food insecurity is impacting child protection? And this goes back to the question that Joanna asked at the very beginning. So how do we as humanitarian actors effectively collaborate? And that's something that we'll be working on more through this initiative. Um, the Global Report on Food Crisis reported that last year, over 190 million people were acutely food insecure. So we know that as global hunger remains alarmingly high, um, this will impact children's protection and well-being. And it's, it's quite evident that there is this link through our evidence analysis, through our evidence review. So really, how can we work better together and what does this mean? And practically, it can mean a lot of things, right? It can mean planning responses together, ensuring child protection and food security programming are in the same locations, trying to work together to develop joint targeting and vulnerability criteria, having functional referral pathways, mitigating child protection risks in food security programming, um, and the evidence review, which is coming out in the next month, will provide a set of recommendations for child protection and food security actors across the program cycle and also look at specific child protection risks. So, I'm really excited for the rest of our initiative, which is working with the child protection and food security clusters in Nigeria, in Central African Republic, and in South Sudan um, to try and see what works and what's feasible in terms of collaboration. Thanks so much, everybody, for listening. I hope I haven't gone over time. And Joanna, I'm going to hand it back to you for the rest of our session today. Huge thanks, Yang, for the wonderful presentation and all the work that's gone into producing this uh, piece of research for the sector, for the two sectors. Um, I think, as you say, there's, you know, it's a space to watch the report coming out and then the actions coming out of it. Um, and um, I think there'll probably be lots of questions for you in the chat box if you can answer them. We are going to now move into a session of Q&A with our panelists. Just before we do that, let's find out again a little bit more about you who's on our, uh, in our audience. If we could launch poll number two, which is asking about whether or not you have experience of running an integrated or, or joint program. So if you've been part of a project that integrates child protection in another sector. If you answer yes, I don't know that you can answer right in the chat. I think in the chat box, we ask you to let us know what, um, what uh, sector it is, what, what has been the two that you've been able to merge. So the vast majority of you are here because you have experience already in integrating child protection in another sector or being in a sector where you've integrated children's protection, um, which is great. So we definitely should be drawing from that um, as we move through in the next session, set, segment of the session, which is our Q&A with panelists. We have some questions, as you can imagine, lined up, but if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Also, if you have any answers to the questions I'm going to be asking our panelists and would like to share that, then please also put that in the chat box. Um, and then, um, Stephanie, if I could ask you to just keep an eye on the questions, um, we may have the time to throw the floor to you to um, ask one or two of them. So the first question I have um, kind of takes us back to the start, which is about having a common understanding, having common language between sectors and a common understanding of what we do. Now, we know that education and child protection have been at this for a while. Um, you know, for, for decades in terms of both having the mandate to work with children, but more recently with um, specific initiatives um, between INEE and, and the Alliance. So my question, I guess, for um, David, starting with you, but then also maybe for Agnes um, uh, from, the, from the CCCM point of view is, what are lessons that child protection actors and other humanitarians 
could learn about the process of finding common language and a common understanding between sectors. Yeah, you don't start with easy questions, do you? So, so <laughs> straight, 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 straight in there and sort of uh, um, please find the answer to how we make humanitarian responses better in all ways immediately, please. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I mean, Stefan is right. It's, but but <clears throat> you're right. I, I, I mean, I've, I, I've always thought that education, I'm, I'm, I'm an educationist, but I've, I've always thought that educa in education, the importance of um, intersectoral work really comes to, um, is really clear. A child who is hungry, a child who's sick, a child who is frightened cannot learn. Um, and that's absolutely essential. So in all my career as an educationist, I, I have been absolutely um, insistent upon the importance of cross-sectoral working. Um, and I think it is partly a question of language, but I think it's actually more a question of culture I think it's a more a question of understanding that children are holistic beings, that children exist in the world. Children are not um, objects with which we interact. They're people um, with all the complexities and all the, the difficulties that, that entails. Um, and that therefore requires all of us, whichever our sector, whatever our sector, to be thinking about children as holistic individuals. Um, and for the reasons I was talking about earlier, that can be really difficult because resources are limited uh, and those resources aren't necessarily money. Often money is the least of our problems. It's, 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 it's expertise, it's space, it's time, it's government support, it's um, the, the, the distractions that we have as technical experts in having to, to feed the bureaucratic beasts of our organisations. Um, so it's, 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 not an easy, it's not an easy solution. There isn't an easy solution. But I would strongly urge all of us to continue to think about children as individuals. Because if we do, then a lot of the issues that we're trying to face are dealt with. I don't think I answered your question, but I think it's important. I think it's a great answer um, and, and something that we absolutely need to keep at a forefront and, as you say, may help us as we work with sectors who, you know, don't see children as their direct mandate. Agnes, how about you? That, that, that's certainly the case of CCCM. Yes, yes and no. Uh, actually, thank you for, for the question and I'll go back to the issue of the language uh, and speaking this common language, especially for sectors that indeed not necessarily see child protection at the heart uh, of their mandate. Um, and you've mentioned already a couple of interesting examples when the, with the co-development uh, of guidance and tools between child protection actors and CCCM1. Uh, you did participate in the review of the camp management standards, while we also did participate in the review of the chapter 28 of uh, the child protection minimum standards, the chapter uh, on uh, CCCM, to make sure that what was in there was also speaking to CCCM people. Because sometimes we can have different uh, approaches. Let me take you, uh, take an example, for instance. Often uh, humanitarian actors will use, will use the humanitarian program cycle, the HPC, to develop guidance and tools. If you do that with CCCM people, you will lose them like quite quickly because while we are aware about it, we often refer to our own cycle, which is the camp management, uh, the camp, camp life cycle. Uh, that starts with the setup and the, prevent, the, the preparation part, and then goes to uh, the care and maintenance part, and then to durable solution and closure, camp closure. So that's just an example of a framework that we use doing camp management, and that we should use probably also to mainstream and integrate child protection throughout its different phases. So that's just an example how the, the language matter uh, to make sure that we understand each other in the process and that what we come up with is relevant and understandable by, by both sides. Over. Great. Thank you, Agnes. A really clear example of, of where we need to understand each other and, and how we develop our, our ways of working. Um, we're going to look at, for some answers in things that have worked already. So. Um, things that you'd say, times where we've been able to, you mentioned of commenting on each other's minimum standards as uh, a practice that worked well, Agnes. But let me, um, I think, maybe talk, move again to David. 
uh, maybe in food security. Yang, if you can think of some of the promising practices. And also, I know that Kate, in our preparation, you've talked about some of the promising practices in, um, in camp management. So Yang, maybe starting with you. Yeah, sure. Um, and this came out through the evidence review. I found a couple of really exciting examples linking um, food security programming with family strengthening. So in one program evaluation found that when food security assistance was coupled with family strengthening interventions like positive parenting, it not only increased the family's food security, but also reduced children's exposure to violence um, in the same families. Um, and this was complemented by another study that similarly found children in villages who are receiving agribusiness training, as well as parenting programs reported a higher rate of reduction in child abuse compared to those who are only receiving the parenting interventions. So I think we have some emerging and really exciting evidence that shows when we can bring together interventions from both food security and child protection, we may actually be seeing greater impact um, and more effective programming. And I think to me, this is really exciting, especially thinking about the consequences on mental health, on child and caregiver relationships that have also come out in the evidence and definitely an area to explore as to how child protection and food security can begin to complement and layer services together. Did you want me to go, Joanna? Please. Um, I thought I'd talk about something that we're thinking about here in Ukraine. So um, as you will all appreciate, um, uh, there's a mental health crisis in Ukraine. Um, uh, particularly amongst children, children who have been caught up in conflict, children who have been displaced, children who are refugees, children who are simply um, seeing from social media or the television or listening on the radio about what might be happening um, in Ukraine. So there is a mental health crisis. Um, there's also a um, particular stress point at the beginning of the next school year, which is scheduled to be in September, where for the first time in over a couple of years, teachers, many teachers will be in a classroom face to face with their students. Um, the teachers, as we were saying earlier, will be suffering from mental health issues themselves. Their students will be um, uh, in, in uh, will be, uh, have, will have mental health questions as well. In parallel with all of this, the government of Ukraine has been introducing a new um, education Focus. They, they, they're trying to move from an old, uh, old style pedagogy into a uh, child centered, child learning um, uh, pedagogy. And they're moving this through year by year. Um, and teachers are saying to us that they're finding both the questions of the new pedagogy and the questions of mental health, child protection issues, really quite challenging. They're, they're, they're new issues, they're being getting a lot of online training and it's all quite difficult for them. Um, and so what we're talking to the ministry about, um, many partners are talking to the ministry about, are putting in place, as, as the educationalists amongst you will have already worked out, um, teacher learning circles, so that teachers themselves have an opportunity to talk amongst themselves both about the pedagogy and also about mental health issues, and that they are meeting on a regular basis and thinking about um, uh, learning, uh, child-centered learning, thinking about mental health issues. Both interweave, both are closely connected. Um, and it's also a sustainable um, intervention because once it's up and running, it's something that will continue because we're confident that teachers will find it helpful and will find it useful. So, I mean, that's a very immediate and very practical and very kind of gritty example of something that we're, we're, we're looking at um, here on the ground in Ukraine, um, and which I think will, um, it's been done elsewhere. I'm not, I'm, I'm not for a minute trying to say this is the first time this has happened, um, but it is, I think, a very good example of intersectoral working where child protection issues and education issues come together because children, <laughs> because children are individuals, because, of the, because you're trying to think about this um, uh, all, all, all in one holistic um, uh, focus. Thank you. Thanks again. Kate, do you want to build off that? 
Yeah, certainly. Um, I think when I was first uh, first thinking about this, I think a lot of the um, considerations you start from a camp management perspective, I think, is to think of child protection very um, as a very technical sector. Um, and I think there's a lot more work being done um, than people would necessarily sort of initially think. And I think some of the, the language aspects, I think, is going to be really helpful with that. Um, when we're thinking about CCCM, I think as well, the CCCM within a camp, you often think about coordination of services, the service standard monitoring, but it also spans community engagement, participation, communication with communities and accountability, and then the physical site environment, um, which is a continuum with shelter. And where the continuum stops, it depends on sometimes the response and who is implementing as well. Um, but I think a couple of the interesting examples for me, um, sort of operationally at camp level have been around participation um, and participation particularly on the, the site uh, environment and the physical site um, aspect. Um, one of which has been um, being involved in projects on child participatory mapping. Um, so working with a child protection, with camp management actor um, and children in the camp, physically mapping out the camp space where, pe where children, how children use the space, how they perceive it, safe and unsafe areas. And then because of the engagement of camp management in that exercise, and it not just being done by child protection, really being able to effect change in the camp. Children use this pathway, not that pathway. They feel unsafe on this bridge. And it being really that integration um, and the joint work between child protection and camp management means we saw much more immediate results and where it if it were a child protection actor working on their own and coming with that and with camp management as well, because there's the coordination aspect, bringing in other actors, WASH as well in particular. Um, so yeah, I'm, I think there's a, maybe some more examples. And if you asked a CCCM person, I don't think they would necessarily consider it to be child protection, but this, yeah, this language around the consideration of children um, that we're working into these documents. Um, I think also starts to draw out some of these really good practices that can be built on. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Agnes, for um, some of those kind of practicalities. And Yang made the point um, in the chat that we all see each other as super technical and we can't possibly, you know, find common ground or a way to speak or an entry point when in reality, when we, you know, ease up on the language, ease up on our technicalities, we see there's lots of ways that we can be protecting children better or we can be promoting their you know, use of a campsite, um, you know, in a, in a more cohesive way and, and so on, which, which is super. Um, already we've had the word donor mentioned, um, and uh, it, it is an important one. And we're, we're having a session tomorrow that looks like specifically at food security and, and um, children's protection. And donor issues have come up in that one. So if you're interested in this topic, I, I flag that uh, session uh, tomorrow. Um, which is called Disrupting the Ways We Work. Um, so who amongst us, I have here that um, maybe in health and in food security, there might be some new donors or some new ways of speaking with donors to draw out the need to have this more collaborative approach. Norian, should we start with you? Sure. Uh, yes, when, uh, of course, was in, in order to implement programming, we need funding and we need to coordinate with, with, with donors. And many don't, at least many humanitarian donors are always uh, multi-sectoral in nature and like ECHO or BHA, they are like trying to be champion for holistic programming. So that makes integrating child protection into other sectors easier. For example, in the past with the, uh, ECHO and the BHA funding, we have been successfully able to integrate nutrition wash into health service delivery. And then we started working with the child protection sector to see, to integrate child protection into health service delivery. So in terms of like uh, donors, one, they want us to integrate protection or like protection is like one big tech sector they want to integrate into other sectors. So I think we have the opportunity to integrate or mainstream child protection into health service from health point of view. And I think with the donors who are not, I would say not very sensitive, I think it is our duty to educate them to on the importance of integrating uh, child protection into health, nutrition and other sectors, how that is important to have a more holistic service provision for children. And I think 
it's our duty to educate them. I will stop here. Over. Yang, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I think in food security, um, similar to what Nuryan mentioned, there are kind of donors, and we can have some really you know positive examples of where um, donors are open to funding multiple sectors. I have to say, though, I really struggle to find examples of integrated child protection and food security programming where we were actually measuring or evaluating joint outcomes. So maybe if there's a, even though there's a donor willingness, our own program design might not necessarily be there. Um, I did speak to someone where um, they mentioned a donor that was actually holding them accountable and asking, how is this child protection program that I'm funding in this location being coordinated with the food security programming that I'm also funding through another actor, show me how you're actually working together across sectors. And I thought that was actually kind of something that's really important. Um, I did have an example of um, a key informant that shared that when they tried to propose to a donor working in both child protection and food security in the same location, they did receive pushback because the donor felt or is perceived that this would reduce the total reach, the total number of beneficiaries reached by the program because both CP and food security would be overlapping. And so here kind of building our kind of evidence base, doing advocacy with donors on why this is important to really join up our different programs and service provision, I think would be yeah, a key takeaway for me, as well as finding different ways to link. So if you can't put them all in one funding and one programming. How can you reach across organizations? How can you reach across clusters to find other ways when, when it's not possible to do that under the umbrella of a single fund, a single funding opportunity? Super. Thank you both. Um, it seems like, you know, there's obviously work on our side to advocate, to clarify, and also, as Yang, you say, to prove, to generate the evidence to show that whether it's for individual children, groups of children, children writ large, there are enhanced um, outcomes. And that outcomes don't have to come at the cost of, you know, uh, child protection, uh, sorry, at the cost of camp management or at the cost of um, education, I don't think it would be so much of an argument, but, you know, at the cost of health interventions or food security reach and so on. Um, as, as David said, it's not always about money, but when a donor says we want it this way, we can see the value in this way, it makes us think of where those little connections are that can help us move forward. Um, so one last question to the group, and then if um, I don't know if there's any questions, Stephanie, that you've generated, you can see generated in the in the chat box, but we could come to one. OK, so just quickly, then um, we know that there's a lot of um, of lessons to learn in, from other um, protection actors going through their mainstreaming work. So the Global Protection Cluster and then in particular GBV. So I'm wondering if a few of you could talk to kind of lessons you've taken away from that in other work that we should be really focusing on uh, as we focus zero in on children's protection. Agnes, should we start with you? Sure, thank you. And thank you for bringing this question uh, in the discussion because indeed there's a lot of lessons learned from uh, the work that we have been doing, uh, especially on uh, GBV risk mitigation since 2015. Um, one thing, one interesting thing was at the beginning we had to understand uh, why we had as CCCM people, and I could even include shelter people, why we had to do GBV. And we had like a, a, spent months and months to discuss why would CCCM people have a role to play in there um, and understanding what we were talking about. And little by little, but it took months and months uh, to, to agree. But in the end, we, we phrased it around good programming. It's not necessarily that you have to work on GBV, but this is just good programming. This is good CCCM programming. This is good shelter programming. And this is also your responsibility as someone coming from another sector to mitigate the risk of GBV uh, in your own operations. And so once we managed to find this common language, then things started to, to really move uh, forward. One thing that has proven to be quite efficient is uh, 
instead of developing uh, standalone resources, guidance, capacity building material, one very interesting approach is to actually mainstream uh, the topic. So in that case, child protection within existing resources of each mm -hmm. sector so that the practitioners of the sector are already familiar with their own resources. And again, they take it as part of their daily job and not something on top that we're trying to put on them. So this integration into existing sector resources is, I think, uh, has proven to be very efficient. Um, also, as, as we are actually doing now, inviting each other to uh, retreat, keeping abreast of development. We are very happy to be here uh, with you today. Uh, and we will have in our global CCCM uh, cluster retreat uh, that's taking place these days, also a session on child protection mainstreaming. And so through this exchange, we can also uh, try to, uh, again, uh, speak the same language, exchange, find similarities, find linkages and synergies. And that's how we, we manage to, to move forward. Um, one other learning and, and maybe uh, also we will probably not sort it out uh, here, but one important topic that I wanted also to bring uh, in the discussion um, is that over the past years, uh, we've had a, a number of uh, topics, cross-cutting top topics uh, to main, mainstream in our operations. And there are many, and they're all super important. Uh, we talk about GBV, but we talk also more recently about disability inclusion, uh, and there are more coming, and uh, child protection. And at one point, uh, it's important also to see how, well, first we shouldn't drop one topic after the other, but build on uh, what has been done in the past and try to integrate all of them and break these silos little by little uh, to come towards a more yeah, integrated approach so that our programming is yeah, more open to all the different uh, issues, people that we work with in the camps, uh, challenges and yeah, breaking these silos, trying to work together and not dropping a topic after, after another, but building on, on them each time. Fantastic, thank you. Noyan, do you want to speak to health? Uh, sure, uh, thanks. I mean, I agree with what Agnes is saying, like instead of having a standalone guidance on how to mainstream child protection into health, I think it's good entry point will be looking at the guidance already, the SOPs we have in the health and then see how can we integrate child protection into that. So there's, there's adding like additional chapter or having an additional guidance in the, to the existing existing uh, uh, documents or technical guides for health. I think that works. One comes to mind is it when you look at like the uh, risk communication and community engagement, I think it's a main a huge thing come after during the COVID pandemic and like trying to engage communities and also communicating the risk of uh, COVID with the communities. So with that, we could also see how can we add community-based child protection aspect into, into that the RCC component. That's like one entry I could think of. The other one is when we again look at the community, we have the integrated community case management of childhood illnesses, which we work with community health volunteers to provide curative services. And I think it, the child protection aspect can be easily added to what they are already doing. And when we look at the facility-based service delivery, we have like, uh, again, integrated uh, management of like uh, common childhood illnesses. That is like, uh, you know, you more focus on children and that the child protection can be added as well. And the other area I'm thinking of is uh, adolescent sexual reproductive health, where we can add early childhood, uh, early marriage prevention, things like that can be integrated. One other thing I want to add about like uh, uh, SGB, that the gender-based violence protection, I mean, it, it's something uh, become more focused, I guess, in the last five, ten, five years. Uh, we had, we have done a lot of evidence review, and we had like good policies at the global level. And it was, it was 
publicized or like the information was shared widely so everybody was aware so looking at like learning from there uh, the success story i think having a policy policies that you know supported with more practical tools and also backed up by donors can support like mainstreaming or integrating child protection into all different sectors i will stop here Brilliant. Thank you both. Um, really some good concrete ideas and ways to move forward for us all. Um, so if I could bring the slides up, thank you to all the panelists. Um, there was one question about what is our obstacles? What's what's holding us back? I don't know if you want to answer to that specifically in the chat box would be great if you think there's one or two things that are stumbling box or I would put it to the asker um, just to think of the reverse of we're not doing enough of the different things that the, the presenters have, have been speaking to. So um, if we could come back to the presentation, just we'll wrap up in the next three, three maybe four minutes maximum. Um, just wanting to stress for you a little bit about our call for action. So we have the clarion call in which there is a strategic objective about collaborating across sectors for children's protection and well-being and here's seven of the steps that the working group has come up for in come up with in our um, initiative and in our intersectoral framework the first one around common understanding so we've talked about clear and simple language defining you know having a culture as david put it um, defining what a child protection sensitive approach is what does that mean um, the second one you can see around coordination and collaboration about breaking down our silos uh, wherever possible. Yes, we're technical areas, but we have a lot of commonality, um, especially when we put children, individual children, individual families in our focus. The one about competencies, um, I think has been spoken to in different times by the panelists, but thinking about common core skills to work with those who are not in our own sector. What do we need to have, whether we're a WASH actor, a food security actor, an education specialist, a child protection worker, the openness of mind, the understanding about the common goals and so on. Standards, uh, need I say more, coming from the CPMS working group and we've, we've heard from CCCM about their standards and so on. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the panel about tools and about integrating into existing tools, not creating our own. Um, so really our practical tools and guidance for doing our work together. Um, Yang will be working on this in those three settings that she talked about to, to test different things with the CPOR and the Global Food Security Cluster um, in the Working Across Sectors Initiative of the CPMS Working Group. We have this co-revision approach um, that my colleague Jeanette is working on. Um, and then, of course, um, for our, our colleagues from INEE, INEE and the Alliance have a joint education and emergency CPHA guidance coming out um, that uh, will really be the gold standard for, for the two sectors collaborating. Um, the next little circle you see is around research and evidence. Um, you saw Yang's brilliant uh, presentation and, and the amount of work that has gone into trying to pull out um, from uh, food security actors, from child protection actors, from documentation. What are we learning about um, how we work? Um, so thinking about having unified definitions, indicators, measurement of child well-being, what does that mean for for all of us or at least two sectors working together and, and then maybe hopefully making that broader across the humanitarian effort. And then finally in our call for action, looking at um, having enough time. So doing joint advocacy and having part of that, having enough time to work together. Um, uh, David said, it's not only about money, it's about having the space on our agendas, it's about having the people, about having the attitudes. So enough time to work together from the assessment phase and tomorrow in that food security session, two of our colleagues will be talking particularly about you know, joint analysis and, and getting the, the same understanding from the get-go. So let us think about how we can advocate together. So just wrapping up now, 
Um, <laughs> tomorrow's session sounds good. It will be good. This session was great, and that one will be another great session. After this session, um, there'll be an infographic session. Um, so as you leave this one, please do consider going and heading there. If you are looking for more resources about working across sectors, then there's a number of places you can go, number of resources that already exist, both video, uh, e-course, written materials, imagery, and so on. So you can see that there is um, a working across sectors page within the Alliance website, uh, again, in all four languages, um, as well as looking at, if you click, you'll see our working across sectors um, are working together uh, intersectoral framework. And we encourage you to pick that up. There's a, a couple of at a glance pieces that are pretty easy to consume, easy on the eye, easy to absorb. Um, so I think with that, if we go to the last, um, the last slide, we will see that final reminder of what it is that we're trying to achieve. So together, we're seeking improved outcomes for children, where the protection and well-being are institutionalized as a core commitment to all humanitarian actors across all sectors. So with that, thank you. Thank you to all the presenters. Thank you from everybody on the panel. Um, for your participation. We hope that we can still be in touch and will still be in touch individually and as groups. Um, and we invite you to give a little bit of feedback on the session by filling out the link that is in the chat box. Wishing you all well and, uh, and returning on to another session at the Alliance annual meeting today and then joining us again tomorrow for a full day. Bye for now.